<laughs> this is new screen. Welcome everyone to the late night show with Ken's restaurant guy. You know what? It's really cool that tonight is my first solo since we started doing this late night show. And uh, we're super excited. I'm super excited. I used to say we. I'll be probably saying that all night uh, for today's guest is saying we because Dominic is usually with me. Uh, but unfortunately, Dominic couldn't make it tonight. So hopefully he's watching us. Dominic, you better be watching us if you are, <laughs> wherever you are. Um, anyways, we have a great guest on tonight. And it is it is a hot topic of what we're going to talk to our guest about that I think everyone will want to lean in on this. Um, just a reminder to everyone on TikTok, we will definitely see you there. Please join us over there, as well as join us on Instagram and Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, everywhere else. We are live. So thanks again for joining the Late Night Show. So we're going to have some fun tonight. And first of all, I want to introduce our guest. So let's, and I got a new screen, everyone. And it's about the size of a small flat screen TV or a big flat screen TV. It is so big. So anyways, so welcome everyone. And uh, let's bring our next guest in. Let's. I'm trying to adjust all this music and stuff on this big screen. I think big screens would be easier, but they're not. <clears throat> oh, and by the way, it's not a podcast. So anyways, I want to welcome Val Uffold. Val, welcome so much. Hey, thanks for having me. You know what? This so, so, so I have to apologize, first of all, because I'm, I got this big screen. I wish you could see how big it is. It's it's so big. Are your face <laughs> like, is massive on it? No, no, yours is just by the oh, way. Oh, great. <laughs> just not my yours is. So, and then I've got cameras here. I got screens up there, lights, and all this stuff. And uh, yeah, so if I trip over stuff today with this big screen, I apologize already. Um, but, anyways, let's talk about what you do. And uh, I like to a little bit about who you are. You are, uh, from everything that I've read about you, you're like the go to in the industry when it comes to recruitment. And uh, I I have so many questions in this subject, in this area, that is, I, like, it'll be a great talk tonight. And thank you again for taking the time. I know you're in Toronto tonight, so I know it's 930 there and it's 730 yeah. here out west. So um, thank you again. Like, I, I just, I always get amazed to get people in Toronto. We had some people in New York on uh, recently and I'm like, okay, we'll keep it short so you guys <laughs> get to bed early. And, uh, but we'll have fun tonight, but lots yeah. of stuff. So let's, let's, let's get you to introduce yourself, yeah. who you are and uh, all the great stuff you do. Yeah. All right. So I do executive recruiting in the hospitality field only in that space. So that's hotels, restaurants, entertainment, events, anything like that. Um, I've been doing this for about 12 years. My background is in restaurant operations. I was a sommelier and a restaurant manager and then got into HR in a, re a large restaurant company for 10 years. So I, came by recruiting naturally, so to speak. I did lots of internal recruiting um, and it gives me a good perspective because I've done, you know, I've done the operations role, I've done HR and now recruiting and all those bits have really helped me with that recruitment piece because I can see it from all different angles. Wow. Is this, is this something that it, it's got to changed over the years? Yeah. I mean, every year certainly is completely different depending on what the market's like. And as you sort of mentioned, you know, it's been a big ticket, a big talked about piece in all industries, especially in hospitality. So, yeah, the last few years have certainly been a lot of ups and downs and all arounds for sure. Is it is is like I have so much I don't know where to start here. How much has it changed in a sense where we have AI now coming into the into so much of our industry period? Is it coming into this massively as well? It has. I mean, I don't see it as much. The only time I've seen it is using it as a piece of advice to people that are interviewing and inter being interviewed where they can put, you know, ask what questions, like if you put, take the job description that you're applying for and put that into that, that, that chat thing, the AI thing, and I will pop questions that you will be asked and answered how you should answer it in the same way for the interviewer. So that's something I've been using, telling people to use it for, um, it just actually came into effect in, well, it's in reading right now in Ontario. It's probably in other provinces as well, where you can't use AI to answer um, your job ad. So if you're applying online, 
they're not they're making that a bill that ai can't be the one to come back to you with the, i don't know all the lingo but they're taking <laughs> that out of a lot being allowed to use that at all because it found there's a lot of discriminatory pra discriminatory practices involved in that so those are the only kind of things i've heard about recruiting specifically but that's pretty interesting yes. thing about not allowing it to happen there's just yeah all, yeah i it didn't know that it, it's tied up with a whole bunch of other bills that people are speaking about and that's one little part that I haven't heard. I've just recently heard about. Is, is, it's got to be hard to even track that or monitor that because it must change like every day. It, it must be. And I have no idea how they even would monitor that. There must be, I don't know, there's got to be some way they do it, but I'm sure it's there's a 16 year old. It's a 16 year old. It's a yeah. 16 year old. <laughs> yeah, probably. I'm sure I'll just figure it out. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So can you maybe share a little bit about really what we see right now? Is there a demand for restaurateurs, hotels, everyone still, I hear this every day. Mm -hmm. Val, I'm so, I'm so glad you made the time for us because I have to get this out. I hear this nonstop about we have a labor problem. We have a labor problem in the industry. Val, can you tell us, do we seriously have a label labor problem? It is interesting that we still do. Um, okay. when, but overall we're hearing there's not that many jobs in Canada. There were, you know, there was something like 190,000 people, new workers in January entering the Canadian yeah. job market and the job market stayed the same. So meaning there should be less jobs, but hospitality still has something like a hundred thousand open positions. Mm -hmm. So even though there's a massive shortage across Canada, there's certainly not within hospitality specifically. Is that jobs that are like a, a lower pay or is that a starter? Like an, that's, like a, I think that's all just, they've lumped all? It's, all, it's food service and accommodation. So anything in there. So it could be, yeah, it could be an entry level position right up to like a C-suite role at a hotel or something. But generally so overall, all, lots of positions available. Still lots of positions. Now, do we see people retiring? Is that, is that where that void is coming or is it just because we're growing the industry so big? I think there was, there was a few reasons. I think the market was going down even before COVID. There was, you know, there was less people getting into this industry for lots of reasons that we could talk about forever. You know, perception, what people think the industry is all about, parents not suggesting it as a career to their kids, um, people coming in or taking that at school just to get a degree but not staying in it. So yeah. there's lots of different reasons that COVID came. So people left en masse. Um, and there was no immigration during all the, that time as well. And it's typically yeah. an industry where there's a lot of new immigrants working in it. So we're, yeah, it's yeah. going to take us a while to catch up with all that stuff. Really? Yeah. Now I got to, like I said, I have lots of questions for you. Yeah. And okay. one of them is, and I find this is that we haven't really done a great job. And I know restaurants Canada does, and, and I love my, the team that I work over there with um, and what they do for our industry. And I, and I do as well. Um, trying to promote a positive take on our industry, but there's a, there was a lot of negativeness through COVID, but even right around now, you still have uh, maybe not an appeal to the generations that want to get into this industry or look at it as a career base. Is that the case? Like, or am I just looking through my lens and don't see people out there being attracted to this industry anymore? I think that, you know, interesting you bring up Restaurants Canada because I had a panel discussion and Kelly Higginson, the CEO, was on it talking about this, this exact thing. And that's what a bunch of, like, a lot of us are trying to change that, right? The change of perception of it. And it's, there are lots of bits and pieces, but I remember speaking to, um, she was a, a VP in HR a hotel talking about the fact that we need to sell it to the parents now because it's, it's a, an industry that's been misunderstood um, for many years as, you know, it doesn't seem as a career job. A lot of people think it's like an interim job for a lot of people and people aren't yeah. looking at it, all the different things there are to do in this, in this industry. So I think that's just people speaking about it and starting like right at the high school level to get people even to understand, well, it doesn't mean you're, you know, it doesn't mean you're cooking or serving forever. There's lots of careers you can get into it. And it's sort of starting at that very beginning because you're right. It does have that. It takes a lot of us to be able to change that thinking about it. Well, I also, I like, this is my take is that we also have shows and, you know, the oh, media yeah. really would jump on the negative part of the industry. Not really talking about the positive all the time, right? Like there would yeah. be like a store closing or a restaurant closing 
and they'd be out front with a camera and mic talking about, fortunately, this restaurant's closing. So it really wasn't a place that would be drawing people in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those. I mean, a lot of those shows certainly aren't helpful to the people's perception. And when they, and that even changed, you know, when I first started working in restaurants, yeah. uh, like over 20 years ago, it wasn't this, you know, the, the Food Network wasn't around and it became very romanticized and people got into it for reasons that perhaps weren't the reason they used to get into it. And then that just, that also created problems. And then all those TV shows came and everyone yeah. something different than it was. So people are getting into to be a celebrity or then, you know, and again, parents are watching and saying, well, you can't do that. That's not a career option. <laughs> it when it's actually, happen. you and I both know it's not actually like that. No, it's not. And, and and I know even the ones that say that this is the way it is. I I still, I don't think it's as, like, I don't think, I think they over glamour, make me a little bit over the edge on that part. Like right. it's not the full truth. And I, I think we need more shows like Chef, like the movie Chef, uh, where it's very positive and you watch and you want to go buy a food truck right away yeah. and get involved in it. Um, I, 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 I just, I find that we have, we don't do a good enough job to talk about the positive mm. about it. Yeah. And there's so much positive from it. And I think, do you, do you see this as well? And I think you might've said this is I get people texting me nonstop. So about my hat. So there you go, James. Um, <laughs> I can't, what does it have on it? I can't, I can't. Right. So, so here you go, James. Here's so Val, we'll do a, We'll do a commercial for uh, yeah. James. This is Beyond Meat. This oh, okay. Meat. Yeah, yeah. There it is. <laughs> so there you go, James. <laughs> I I actually had their steak product this today for supper. So there you go, James. Good luck. Um, and, and, and Troy, I moved over to the camera. So thank you for the text <laughs> as well. Um, but I think I I think that um, I think we need more positive. Is my take on this in the industry? But I also need to think. And maybe this is maybe this is a shift that we'll see, is a career based, more of a career based um, perspective. Because is it is it different than in the U.S. or in Europe that you see, Val? I mean, I can comment on Europe. Where yes, for sure in Europe. I think the the U.S. Some of the the larger cities where there is more of a culture around dining, perhaps that's a different. Yeah. But for sure in Europe, it was always. You know, it was always an industry where serving was a career and you went to school, you went to hotel school for four years and then you graduate and you became a server. And that was a very, that was a great career. That was yeah. a stable career where you made good money and had good work. Like, you know, there was lots of things. So I think that hasn't necessarily translated over to here yet. Uh, but there's problems in Europe now, too, with with all sorts of things. But I just think it's it's just we're just further behind in a lot of things around food or wine or dining or any like the dolce vita or whatever like that yeah. north america is just a bit behind with all of that stuff you know we, we put a lot of emphasis on you know the hard skills or the finance part or the instead of these you know intangible things i guess with having a career in restaurants or hospitality so val i want to talk a little bit about and i this this will be interesting because i have a daughter trying to get into the industry and she's having the craziest time and, I, and i'm so honored that she's kind of following the footsteps of what i did for her career and she's having a hard time and i don't know if it's because she's new to the new to the industry she has no experience uh her dad's the canada's restaurant guy so i think that would help but apparently it doesn't um but do you see more still a challenge for women getting into the industry and some leadership roles within the industry or is that just gone now? Or is that still something we have to discuss? No, it, yeah, and it's something I talk about a lot. It is still a big thing. It's really it, I don't know the I don't have the exact numbers, but it starts out to be 50-50 with men and women joining the industry in entry-level positions. By the time you get to the top, it's like less than 10% women what? in senior levels. Yeah. In specifically in food service and accommodation. I mean, that's consistent through all industries but food service and hospitality specifically is has even less representation and in that eight percent or something of c-suite leaders yeah 90 percent of those people are in hr because the people like a c like a people role there's not not yeah so for sure there is and that's something we need to and that's a lot of thing you know i speak to a lot of employers about that as well as like what do we need to do there's a labor shortage but there are a lot of women out there that are leaving because of lots of different reasons. So we have, everyone needs to be think differently and think outside the box and creatively to keep women in the business. 
because they, they, they do start to leave when they get to the management level for a bunch of different reasons. But yeah, it's for sure still a topic that's very much an issue. <laughs> well, I, is, do you have ideas really on how we can get rid of this, like, or help get these numbers changed around? Because I find it, I, like, and, and I've heard this for a long time, and I thought we would see a shift by now. And I've heard this maybe for the, I don't know, for a long, long time. Yeah, from the beginning of time, I think. I think, you know, everyone was hopeful that maybe this whole shutdown, we would have started to see new ideas. But I feel like, unfortunately, that hasn't really been happening. Um, There are lots of ways. I mean, the one thing is the the schedule of flexibility, which is not just for women, but for everybody. And I just actually um, did a talk about this recently, that it's only ever women that come to me and say, Oh, I need to pick my kids up from daycare. I need to, I can't work nights and weekends anymore. I can't that, but not one man, maybe actually maybe one man is calling me to say the same thing. So that's the question I put out there. Why is that? And so it's, so it's, yeah. is it chicken or the egg? Who knows? And how, what that happens, but there's lots of things that need to change. And that is one thing is that schedule flexibility, oh. um, understanding that it's still the, what traditionally the woman's burden to, to take the, the, to figure out the kid thing um women have to put their like put their hands down and reach up and pull women up with mm-hmm. them for sure but men also need to do that because if there's only less than 10 percent uh women then their men have to be the ones to consciously help women stay and pull their and pull them up with them sort of thing because mm-hmm. women you know if, if it's just women doing it then it's not going to be as effective when there's already so few women in it i i'm i'm yeah well it kind of makes sense. And is that the same thing with different people coming into the country? They must even have it harder. I would, you mean if related to women? Yeah. I would, yeah, I would think so. And again, and, and it, it's all, and it also very cultural. Um, yeah. Because there's a lot of people that, again, we're talking about the perception of the industry. So in some cultures, you you don't, you only can be a professional or that's what, because you come to a new country and so we need to change that perception too. But I'm sure I'm sure it is harder. I don't know what the stats are for um, new immigrants that are female, but I'm sure it's it's harder because they're starting always starting entry level, really. Mm-hmm. Well, the, yeah, and then, then there would be barriers with language and all the challenges, and just learning the industry in Canada is going to be different from a different country. Yeah, and that's going to be very challenging. Yeah, and a lot of and and a lot of and that actually is interesting because they just that's also in this new law that's passing. The same one that had about the AI thing, yeah. I'm not allowed to anymore by law. As soon as it passes, put needs Canadian experience on the job posting. People because were it, doing that. It, it's, yeah, that's also just all. I don't know if it's passed yet. Maybe it has, but it, like two weeks ago, it hadn't passed yet. But there, there'll be a, you no longer can put Canadian experience needed on any job ads in Ontario. Really? Mm-hmm. For that reason, because okay, there, if there's a labor shortage, then what? Like you. It's not like you're a, a doctor or a lawyer that needs a license to work mm-hmm. in a restaurant. I mean, the no Canadian experience is kind of a bunch of, doesn't really, it's not real anyway. Yeah. 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 And, and, and I think, like you said, we have to be a little bit more flexible mm-hmm. in, in allowing people into this industry. Because most of the part of the industry um, is skills that can be taught. Yeah. A lot of it's personality, as you know. I mean, it's the soft skills. Like you can hire, you can yeah. teach someone how to, you know, to, to, cook a steak or to open a bottle of wine, but you can't teach them that sort of emotional experience. You can give the guest or that how to communicate or that warm personality. So I think that's a positive thing about our industry is that mm-hmm. a lot can be taught. We just have to find, we just have to show people that that it, there's a lot of great things to do in this industry. Well, I've seen a lot of really good operators out there and these are fr- more of that, uh, you know, franchise model operators that are larger that can pretty much can take anyone off the street and say, we can make you a chef or we can make you a server. And they have programs built into their, into their companies. That's how I started. I didn't know anything. I had no idea. No idea. I still don't, by the way. <laughs> and and uh, I, I, I started and I remember going, well, this is way different than what TV It wasn't even TV was not even glamorizing. That's how long ago it was. Um, but it was a point where um, they allowed me to grow through it. Like, and it was so supportive. And, and I remember them 
saying, you know, our really belief is that we can make anyone a chef as mm-hmm. long as you learn those basic skills. And I think we need more people like that. And I, I think we need more operations like that. And hopefully there is. But I, um, I know I'm living it right now with my daughter trying to find her a job in the yeah. industry. And, and I I'm blown that, away. Yeah. And that, that, that also what you just said is exactly true for everything. So if there's a labor shortage, then you don't want to lose the people that you have. So the whole thing about retention is a massive topic too. And a lot of that comes from what you're saying is, okay, yeah, for sure you can bring people in and train them on the basic skills. But what about those people that have already mastered that you need to keep them yeah. in your company. So then you give them something else and you put them on a training path to get them to another role. And then once they've done that, then you move them into another position or, you know, and that's sort of what I did. I was in restaurants and then I was worked operations and then I liked HR. So I, you know, I put my hand up and said, I want to develop a training manual, but managers can do that with their staff, like identify yeah. what people want to keep them. Yeah. Like the train, like you said, you train them how to be a chef. Once they've mastered that, train them how to do something else and keep them around. How hard is it for operators to keep people to retain them? Well, that is that's a huge. Because it was now. a time. Like, do you remember like ten years ago? People, I remember the whole thing. People were like, "Well, I can, I'll move over here for ten cents more, or a quarter, or whatever is a dollar more." Is that gone now, or is that something still, or is it hard? No, that was, in fact, last year, or 2022 and 2023, it was more than ever because there was such a labor Mm. shortage. Employees knew that they had the power. People were moving all over the place for, you know, $1,000 more. They moved, then two months later, moved somewhere else because they knew they had the power to, to, they were, yeah, they were in control and they knew it. So that that for sure is happening. I think that slowed down a little bit. You know, there was bidding wars last Mm. people last year for people's kind of like a housing you know the housing war oh, wait a second there was bidding wars was bidding wars i remember saying to clients last year like come to the table with your best offer just like you would in a housing situation because there was so few people wow. and everyone yeah so it's and the and employees knew that's your point so people were moving and so yeah turnover was the most it's ever been last year, I'd say, end of 2022, beginning 2023. It seems to have, from just like anecdotally, sort of plateaued a bit, like it's not as crazy, but still, there's still, I mean, it's one of the highest turnover industries. I think it is number one and then retail is number two. Yeah. Serious. Mm -hmm. So I have a question on this because I know as chefs, and I just was working with a whole bunch of really high-end chefs for a podcast project that we're working on. And it seemed to be something, not like an expectation of them moving from restaurant to restaurant, but it was a way that they were building their portfolio and how they were actually, it was almost like, because back when I was in kitchens, you stayed like it, no matter what, it wasn't like you hopped from one to one and, and you kept hopping. Is that normal for a lot of chefs to still like to do that to from hop from one restaurant to another? Or is that just a group of chefs that do, do that? Or is that normal? Yeah, I think that's normal. When I was when I worked in operations, I worked at like a fine dining restaurant in Toronto for many years, and that was in that level, at the highest level of dining. The chefs that was always, and they actually told you that in chef school. That I mean, yeah. it wasn't three months, but like a year at yeah. a time. It was okay to work here for a year because you're right. You wanted to build your portfolio, and I still think that is a thing. I think there's less um, sort of questions around a chef that's done a in early in their career moving around as there would be someone in the front of house because that was considered part of the culture. You want as many experiences from as many different chefs as you can get. But yes, I would say that's still a thing. So Val, we have a lot of people that watch us from all over the world here on our show. Um, and I know there's a lot of people on TikTok as well, watch us on the show. And they're looking about coming to Canada. Maybe they're moving to Canada or what it is. What are some tips or things that they should look at to get involved into the industry? I'd say the first thing that I tell people is to be flexible about what you're going to do, because I, I feel that, and people need to be realistic. So I would say generally when you're, even if you're coming with Canadian experience and changing your career, you have to sometimes take a step back to move forward. Mm-hmm. So I would say that was, that would be the number one thing. There are a lot of jobs out there, but even though there's no, you know, it doesn't matter about Canadian experience, so to speak, I feel like there's people just have to be realistic in what they want to do. Um, but there, and I mean, there's so many tips for anyone with things like this, but I would always say, get your name out there as much as you can. You're coming in, you, you identify 
come up with a list of where you want to work, do your research, contact as many people as you can on LinkedIn, send them a note, send, you want to get your name known by as many people as possible because you need to stand out, especially if we had 180,000 people enter the job market yeah. last month or sorry, in January. Right. So I feel like that's it. You need to, you just have to be relentless on going after what you want and you can't just accept that you're going to apply and that's it. It's a lot of follow-up. There's a, it's a lot, of, it becomes a full-time job to look for a full-time yeah. mom and you kind of have to go in with that mindset. It's like a strategy, right? You have to have a, yeah. a strategy, a roadmap. I'm putting that together. Do you have any tips and stuff like that that you can share on how to stand out on LinkedIn? Yeah, there are all <laughs> sorts of, yeah. And there's lots of people that do this. Like there's so many tips and I will never say I'm an expert at <laughs> LinkedIn stuff. I can tell you about like resume, how to stand out on in interviews and resumes and stuff. But for LinkedIn, I would say the one the one main thing I've been telling people is um, not to put your title. You're just supposed to put a bunch of keywords, and that really does work. So if someone's doing a search, they're not putting in chef. You're put you're on your title it should say loves food, creative, something yeah. in that tagline, and then in your job experience, it will say what your role is. So you take your, so I know what you're talking about. So the title of your name. Yeah. And then underneath it, there's a brief blurb. That's you don't where you want the title in there. The tag, your tag things. Or like your words, tags. Words words are all are. like keywords. Yeah. That, so when they're searching for things like restaurants or marketing or chefs, that is the information that they're going to It'll, hit on. All well. your words are in there. Like your chef is still there in your title, but you're giving yourself more there be more people open to more people what they're going to find. Uh, okay. Yeah. And the other thing I would say that's kind of seems to be a, a red flag for a lot of employers is making sure that your resume and your LinkedIn are the same. It happens all the time. They're not Serious? The same. No really way. The same. Yeah. There's often like, like, totally different, different dates yeah. of different or different or... things missing, or it's not up to date. It'll have a job from two times before there's one on your resume. That's not on your LinkedIn. So that sets off red flags. No way. Making sure update a picture. I would always say take off that green open to work thing. Okay, please. Everyone that's watching this, Val, that is my biggest pet peeve. And I love everyone that's using it to I know the purpose. But please take that bloody green thing off your your thing. Yeah, I don't, Tell us I don't, why, Val. Tell us why. Because I, I think I know why, but I want to hear from you. You're the expert. I just think that there's still whether it's true or not there's a lot, there's an idea out there that the people that are employed are the best people to hire. So if you have a job, you're going to be mm. more marketable. And so you don't want to advertise that you don't have a job. They're going to find out anyway, but why put that rate out there? It's the yeah. first thing you're telling them. There's lots of other things you can tell them other than that thing at the beginning. It's not, it, maybe it doesn't feel like, you, you know, you're, you're trying to maybe not like you said, you have to work at it to get the job or the career you want. Does that look like it's kind of like this really simple way of saying, hey, I'm looking for a job? Well, that's all. Yeah. And I also think it's the same thing when you go to an interview and you someone's, you know, they have or the same thing if you see on LinkedIn, there's one company that has five different job openings and you apply to all of them. Say you want any of them. That's also not good. It's the same thing. You, you don't want, yeah. you want to be specific and look like, you. yeah, you have a goal. You're going for something. You're working toward not just like, oh, I'll just take anything. It doesn't matter. Okay. Um, I have so many questions more. <laughs> this is great. By the way, thank you again. And just a quick shout out to everyone. James, if you're still watching, I did have some Beyond Burger product today uh, in an air fryer like I taught you. Um, and everyone, uh, please send us questions and everything for Val if you have questions and stuff on Instagram or TikTok or LinkedIn. Um, we've got everything set up so we can get the comments and stuff here. But Val, I, first of all, this is just outstanding, all these ideas and stuff like this. Biggest question, how important is the picture on LinkedIn? Your picture, AI, everyone's, I got AI. I'll admit it. I'm that guy. I got an AI picture there. Is it, is that, is that hitting people hard or is that matter even? Oh, I don't, yeah. I didn't even think, I've never even thought of that AI thing. You mean because they're fake, like they're enhanced photos or something? Oh, uh, I look like I'm 20 years old. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's better. To, I think it is like in an, you're not applying for jobs. So it's OK. But I think yeah. if, if it is an interview setting, I think you want it as close as possible to what you look like, because, again, mm -hmm. you want to feel 
like you know the person when you're in an interview with someone. So it's if you're already nervous about something, you don't want to walk in and they don't recognize who you are. You want them already to know, to have that f- feeling of familiarity because interviews are already like a natural setting. So why make it yeah. worse when you're expecting someone else to show up? It's, a, it's like the, uh, the Tinder profile. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're like, oh no, yeah. What's it called, catfishing or something? Or yeah, it's, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, oh. it would be the same. I think it's the same thing. I think just like, you know, it's, and, and the other thing with the picture is like, it should be a professional photo, like not you holding your dog or your kid or. Uh, yeah, please like, take. It doesn't have to be a headshot. You can't much your, anymore. With your phone, but don't have like or your wedding picture or whatever. Is LinkedIn still like like I, I know a lot of people. I know LinkedIn itself is shifting away to not necessarily be the platform that is like the job board place to be, but is it still the place to be where people are looking? For employers or people are looking for jobs is still like yeah. one of the main places. I would say that's still yeah. I would say that's the main place that people like not job like as far as job postings, indeed, yeah. all those places for sure. But no, I would say LinkedIn is still like the main spot for professional for like those sorts of jobs. I mean, if it's a uh, and they're also on Indeed, but I'd say that is more where where it seems to be. Where more recruiters are looking, where more HR departments are looking. Sure, they put stuff on, on Indeed, but I would say that the majority of people hiring managers that I speak to, they're not there's not great results coming from Indeed. They have better results with LinkedIn because it's set up just to be a very professional place. Yeah. yeah. Is is there um so like I said, I've got quite a few questions here. I don't want to take all your time. It'll be two in the morning, we'll be still asking questions okay. on this. Is I want to talk about a little bit of that process, okay, of having a recruiter or not having a recruiter. How important it is to have a recruiter today? Uh, Because when my daughter was looking to start, she had the company reach out and said, you have to go through our recruiter Mm. to get the job. And we did not know that. It would have been helpful a couple of years ago when she started. Yeah. But is, is that something that you recommend people using is recruiters? Well, that would be what she's talking about is a different kind of recruiter. That would be an internal recruiter. Like each company would have their own recruitment team as part of the HR team. Um, So, but recruiters, like what I do would be, you know, more senior people that, you know, I I wouldn't be able to help anyone with an entry level job because no one's going to pay me to find someone that's has no experience. Yeah. Yeah. Different. Yeah. 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 But for sure. I mean, a lot of, and a lot of what you're doing, a lot of it's now an an, like applicant tracking system, right? Like you were saying. What is that? Tell us what is that? You know, if you on Indeed or on LinkedIn or anything, if there's a link where it, you have to fill something out and send it through mm-hmm. where you're not actually getting to a human, you're just sending it out there and hoping someone sees it. That's where I'd always suggest find out, do that because you're right. You still have to go through that way because they're, they're, you know, their procedure is to do, go through that, that system, but still don't just do that. Again, you have to go above, if you want to stand out, then you need to then go on LinkedIn, find out who the talent acquisition or recruitment manager is in that company, send them a LinkedIn message, send as many people as you can telling them that you applied already. But I would always, I wouldn't just send that in and expect because half the time you don't even get to a human. You're just really, yeah. So there's, you need to, the job ad, there's specific keywords in the job ad, the job description, yep. you need to make sure those words are in your resume, even if you just put them in there somewhere, because that computer system is picking up the keywords and will not send you on to a human unless you actually have those keywords. Um, there's another tip that I've been speaking about recently as well. If you send, you know how you're supposed to send your resume in a PDF format because yep. it makes more professional but if you're applying through an ats an applicant tracking system the studies show that they they are more likely to kick out a pdf resume than a word resume so if you're sent via an eight send through send in word format if you're sending to an email like an actual person then send yep. it in a pdf so sending through the system word doc no pdf email yeah. pdf yeah because PDF looks better, we know that, which is why we've yeah. always told people send a PDF. Well, is, not going to change. I think LinkedIn does. LinkedIn recommend a PDF even. Well, every single company will be using a different 
ATS oh, okay. on LinkedIn. Yeah, it just, yeah. you know, just have the link to it and you click on it. It could be, there's so many, there's hundreds of different software programs that companies buy to, to sort through the resumes. Wow. And I'm assuming that's getting more sophisticated as well. Yeah, which is why they just made that rule where they can't, because they found that 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 they were getting that AI was getting figuring out like, um, you know, if it was a man applying or a woman, it was like discriminatory hiring practices by this computer. So yeah, it's getting more sophisticated. Have you? I've heard this terminology is use for 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 recruiters, and this is my daughter telling me this stuff is use AI against AI when it comes to these AT, ATS systems. Is that true? Oh, I don't know. I haven't heard that. It could be that okay. neither yet. Yeah, it's probably, yeah, the, those those things I don't profess to I know anything <laughs> about the, the okay. AI things. But I'm sure that I'm sure that is going to happen. It's the same thing with, uh, you know, kids writing their essays using chat GPT. And then now there's another program that can detect well, if you sure. use chat GPT. Val, I'm sure you could p- pick out a resume that was AI written versus. Well, I just read. It's funny because I just read something about that, and, and they they showed how you can. And it is it is pretty obvious, but I feel like most people aren't reading. Like most people spend five to six. Most hiring managers spend five to six seconds looking at a resume. Well, wait, 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 five to six seconds yeah. on a resume. That's it. Yeah, five to six seconds on a resume tends to be what people spend looking at it. So they're not, so they're not picking out mm-hmm. if AI wrote it or not. They're looking where you worked, what the dates are, that kind of thing. Unbelievable. At, for that first screening anyway, afterwards, if you're in for an interview, then they would read it. But that first thing, they're not spending that much time looking at your resume. Uh, Val, I saw on a LinkedIn not that long ago, someone that actually was doing a post about who they were. In a sense, it was like a resume, but it was like a, um, it was like a, almost like uh, it was a circle and it had all the different uh, learning skills that they had, their skill sets, you know, their different, different aspects of what they've done in their lives, but it was built into a one page and then they put it on LinkedIn. And I actually thought it was like, I felt like it was a different way of looking at a resume or looking at someone's, someone's uh, experience. Is that something you recommend or should we still stay with the traditions? I mean, I think for LinkedIn, it's a smart idea because again, you want to stand out. You still need to have that traditional yeah. resume, but on link on LinkedIn, for sure, I think that is a great idea, and you want to keep it short and sweet. That's you know, you don't want a resume any longer than two pages. Okay, two pages. Rule. Two pages max. You don't want to talk about your like high school jobs and stuff, um, unless you're just out of high school. Obviously. Oh, what if you're over accomplished person? Mm-hmm. That is past two pages. I've heard people do this too. Yeah, I mean, got- lots of, yeah, for, yeah, for sure. Everyone can write it. A lot of people can write a resume that's five pages long, but I feel like yeah. you need to, people need to like narrow it down. Narrow it down. There doesn't have to be a lot of, you don't have to go really far back. Your current position, your last three positions will sort of give you an idea where you were before that. You obviously didn't go from being, you know, a, lifeguard to being a CEO. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Who knows there's a bunch of jobs in between. Yeah. Wow. Because again, you want it short. So yeah, I think that idea you said about LinkedIn, someone had a graph or whatever. I think that's yeah, yeah. Idea. It's kind of giving them a snap. Like people don't want to yeah. swipe. Even if you send a message to someone or a job ad, it can't, it's not supposed to be longer than a phone because if you have to swipe, it's too long. So the same thing could be said for LinkedIn too. Holy cow. Short attention spans we have now. Oh, you need a master class, by the way. <laughs> I don't know if you do master classes. You'll have to go you? give your daughter some, uh, to give her some of these. Yeah, I'm writing it all down for her. Don't yes. worry. Tell her to call me and I will walk her through some stuff. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I, I think, well, now why has it gotten like this? Okay. Like, because back in the day, like, I, I've been. I, I haven't done the job looking for a year. I don't plan on it either, but I, I am in a sense always wondering how did it get to this? Is it because people messed with the system? Did people cheat the system? Did we hire the wrong people? Are we looking to hire people better? How did it get to what? The labor shortage or? Well, no, no, no. Just the sophistication that we have to make well, sure the resumes are two pages. Well, it's like we everything. It's like everything. It's like even... You know, I always, I always feel like it was easier when things were just like paper and pencil. Yeah. 
it's so, but that's just my generation or whatever. I think that it's like everything has become like, it's a generational thing. I guess every generation like, Oh, it's too, there's too much stuff going on now. But I think that's what it is. I think there's, it's just what's bound to happen. There's so people many still bring resumes into stores. Do people still bring resumes into hotels? I, okay. I don't, I don't even know because to your point, you're not even, you can't even really do that. I mean, I think if you walked okay. into like the local coffee shop or the local restaurant with a res- yeah. resume, yeah. fair. But then if you walked into a hotel, they would literally say to you, you got to go online and apply through the ATS. Like they don't, yeah. like if you had a piece of paper, it wouldn't, it doesn't mean anything to them. So crazy? it's all online now. That's how it was our generation, Val. <laughs> yes, I know. But I mean, there's still, again, you could still walk in with a paper resume and you're, again, you're, you're making yourself stand out as long as the it's next day you send a message on LinkedIn saying, Hey, I delivered a resume yesterday and now I'm going to go on your online track on your online system and apply. There's no harm in doing it. You're only making yourself stand out because no one does stand it. Out. Yeah. Wow. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the C-suite in the hotel, in the industry and how, and what people are looking for when it comes to that, the top level of running organizations, hospitality groups are, is there still people looking for those roles or are those roles filling in? And if they are looking for those roles, are what, what's some of those traits that they're looking for in individuals? What are they looking for? I think there's, there's still lots of those. I think because again, we've heard about how the demographics are changing baby boomers are retiring that's generally who are in those roles so they are more of those roles will be coming up um we also lost a lot you know that during covid we spoke a lot about you know the servers and the cooks and the sous chefs leaving but there was there was holes everywhere because people you know at the highest level were like well in hotels or restaurants were like i'm out because i don't want to go back to the way it was where my whole team was like oh i had to start from scratch and do all the work i did 20 years ago so there were there are more openings and more coming but i think it's the same thing with it like it's always been i feel like it's well-rounded the more successful people have come from come from somewhere within and understand lots of different areas of that industry so it's not um but also having lots of different experiences whether it be you know some corporate some entrepreneurial i think that And there's always still going to be those soft skills in all hospitality. Like even if you are the CEO of the Marriott, you still have to understand that you're in the hospitality business. So there's always going to be that. I do see a lot of C-suite people becoming younger. Is that, is that normal too? I would, yeah, I would, well, as, yeah, as people are retiring. Or am I getting older than I'm like, I don't know. know. I'm I'm all against ageism for sure. As an older person, yeah, but yeah, I think it's yeah for sure. There's people because it's also because because of to your point, everything's so um, AI and yeah. that sort of technology. Where I think it's the younger generation that understands that. So yeah, you do need to bring in, and certainly in some areas, business areas more than others, you need to know all the new stuff. And maybe those people that are have been around longer don't know as much. So it makes sense that you see more younger C-suite people. I want to talk as we wrap up here, Val. I have a question here on seasonal business. Mm-hmm. As golf courses are opening up again, I see people, I, I have been talking to some of the people that I work with in the golf industry. A lot of golf courses are looking for GMs. Um, is it going to be even, and, and I've heard how hard it is. I was at a golf conference this past fall, and it sounds ridiculously hard to find people in seasonal accounts. Is that going to get better or are we going to see that also be a challenge or do you hear anything around seasonal accounts? Well, this was interesting that you heard that because I in fact heard the exact, op- well, it might change again this year, but I heard the exact opposite okay. where the resort towns um, out by you yeah. were always, it was always very, very hard for people, for them to find people. But for yeah. the last few right. years, as it's become more expensive to live in cities, they've actually had, for the first time ever, more people than they need in the resort mm-hmm. properties out west and resort properties than there are that they do other properties in Toronto because people are graduating from university and saying, well, I can't afford that rent. I'm going to go live out there for two years where there's yeah. accommodation and live there. So there, I don't, golf courses are maybe different, yeah. but there's been, it's been easier for them to find as cost of living has increased for them to find seasonal workers 
that are there because of the, the because of the accommodation. And so, in fact, it was one large um, resort chain um, that actually closed down part of their hotel for staff accommodation yeah. because that made more sense for them. The, the cost benefit analysis was better if they close it down and had staff living there than it was to open it for guests. It wow. was made them more money to do that. Well, I know that Banff was always a, well, always a hard time for Banff mm -hmm. to find people. And now it's been people. easier for them the last two years. Yeah, that's great. That's great news. See, there's always positive news. Yeah, in there you go. Yeah. They're all, there's right? no one in the, the hotels in Toronto, but they're all there now. I know it's like, <laughs> yes. Come on like, out. <laughs> yeah. It goes in waves, I guess. <laughs> it's great because... Uh, you know, it, we the tourism comes into those small towns, right? And the tourism business is so big for us out here uh, in mm -hmm. the West. And when we hear that, it really is means that the tourism is going to people are coming in to uh, from different countries to see these beautiful places are going to have a great experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's great news. Uh, yeah. That is good news. I'm There's happy. a silver lining. Yeah. Yeah, I'm hoping golf courses like um, the golf course event I was at. Uh, it was the uh, uh, it was the main event for the year for all golf course when it comes to clubs. And uh, th they did say it was difficult this past year. And I kind of kept telling them in the conference, and I was doing a presentation to them, that we really need to just talk about more of the positive about the industry when it comes to what they do. Because I, I also think working at a golf course is pretty cool as well. Mm -hmm. um, to to And also, those golf courses really do cater and support these people. Um, that are coming in either first time jobs mm -hmm. or starting as a chef or, or running there. And, and you can move very up very fast yeah. Yeah. Uh, with it, of course. And um, mm -hmm. well, I'm hoping that it's good for them as well this year because they really need it. They're, and they're doing great and they're busy. They're crazy busy. Yeah. Too. I mean, I think I do work with private clubs as well, recruiting for them. And yeah. I feel like, yeah, you're right. There's a lot of it's, I think it's just like people understanding what it is. I mean, a lot of people yeah. understand restaurants because people go to restaurants all the time, but people, not everyone goes to clubs. So they don't, it's not top of mind for them. So it's more just about getting the word out there. That's the same sort of, it's the same sort of, it's the same industry. Val, as we wrap up here, and like I said, thank you to everyone that's joined us tonight on TikTok. Thanks for all the, the, uh, uh, who that is. Um, I'll do text everyone. Thank you. Uh, and everyone on, on Instagram and everyone on LinkedIn and stuff like this and Facebook. Um, I do have a question here, uh, Val, as we wrap up. Last couple tidbits for you. If you had someone coming to you and say, Val, what do I do? What's the first thing I do? Can you give us just two tips as we wrap up tonight that they they will never forget in the whole their whole life, even if they start a job, quit a job, whatever it is? What's the two things you tell someone? Around looking for a job? Well, the, the one tip I always will say, well, I told the one tip that I think is really important. I'm going to reiterate because I already said is get your name known as many places as you can. Don't just send a resume, get, find every single person you can on LinkedIn or find their email. You can find out what someone's email is by looking how does, you know, Fairmont do their at, you know, find the name and put at Fairmont, send as many emails as you can to get your name out there. When you get an interview with the hiring manager, send an email to that hiring manager the night before to say, nice to meet you and see you on LinkedIn again, because then they see your face and you've made that initial connection and that wow. helps take away some of the nervousness that it is going into the interview the next day. Um, and then the one, sorry, that's, this is three, but. Oh, you can give us 10 and keep going. <laughs> the whole thing about practicing, like people will say to me, Oh, I, I, you know, I, I interview all the time. I'm, it doesn't like practice makes perfect. And there's a legit reason why that saying is around is because you need to practice talking about yourself in front of a mirror over and over again about your strengths, how good you are in making eye contact practice is what makes a huge difference because interviews are stressful and mm -hmm. there's ways to make yourself feel more comfortable. The more prepared you are, the more comfortable you be, the more confident will be, the more likely you'll get a job. So practice the massive thing that not enough people do when they're just before they interview. That's such great advice. Practice, practice, and and I I uh, I will I all share that with my daughter yeah. <laughs> as well. It is hard. It's uh, awkward to talk to talk to a mirror, but it does make a difference. It helps. I can well, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, because I, I find that um, even just doing podcasts and stuff like this, I tell you, it took fifteen hundred shows later to make me comfortable to even do a TikTok. Yeah. Like that. but it does. It's practice, right? Yeah, practice, right. 
Well, Val, I want to thank you so much. It's late. It's almost 1030 in Toronto. And I just want to thank you. You are so knowledgeable in this space. And uh, I just can't thank you enough for taking the time, sharing some information with us, talking about this and, and giving some good stuff to talk about as well. Uh, I'm just blown away. Thank you so much for your time. Thank today. you very much for having me and yeah, get your daughter to give me a call and I'm happy to share more tips. Okay. Last, where do people yeah. find you if they want to reach out, hmm. follow you, all that stuff? Where do they go? Yeah. So um, Val Upfold is my Instagram and actually on there, there's a whole bunch of interview tips right on there. So there's a really? like a highlight icon called interview tips. And I do all sorts of reels, tips and tricks about interviewing and resumes I post all sorts of stuff on there's more on Instagram because I can do the reels there. LinkedIn also has some stuff, but Instagram has an added bonus of a bunch of different, a more interview and resume tips. Awesome. Well, Val, send me that and I will then put it up on my channels as well. And then I'll include it in my newsletter this weekend. Right. And uh, promote your stuff out there. I just thank you enough. This is so valuable for everyone. And the industry is a great place to work. It's a phenomenal place to work. I've been in a 34, this is my 34th year. Next week will be 34 years in the industry. And I'm just, I, I've had a great career I, and I get to do this awesome stuff now too. Yeah. So it uh, is, no, we just got to get the word out that there's lots of, you know, there's lots of jobs and it's lots of fun and you can learn a lot and there's the sky's the limit what you can do. It is. It really is. And you don't have to just be a chef. You don't just have to be a server. That's right. Is, has anyone ever counted how many jobs there are? In the food service, probably, how many different- I mean, it's the same, almost the same amount of jobs. That I think it's any industry. There's probably more because there's so many different pieces of hospitality. And yeah, I'm going to have to Google that later. Well, so how you many let me know the ones? answer. How many hundreds of jobs there are? That, thousands yeah. of titles, yeah. Titles and titles and titles, right? Yeah, so, title. anyways, thank you again, Val. To everyone thank else, you. thank you again for joining us tonight. And uh, check out Val. Thank you so much. Right. Thanks. Take care. Have a good weekend. Bye. Yes. Bye.